Welcome to DeFund, the podcast making the most important projects in crypto easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Celo, the fully EVM compatible layer one built for mobile first DeFi protocols. Welcome, Marek. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Likewise, yeah, it was a it was a pleasure to have you on. And we're really curious about Celo in general and your journey in crypto. But before we we get into that, I think we can probably touch on the latter point, which is you specifically. So if you could give us an intro into who you are and just a quick fact. Yeah, let me let me start with my quick fact. So I'm from uh, Poland. Uh, my parents are Polish, but uh, I was born and raised in Singapore, and, and I grew up there. Yeah, and then in terms of my background, uh, I'm uh, I have a computer science background. Uh, I studied first um, at the University of Toronto, uh, and then went to MIT for my PhD, where I, I did a lot of work in in parallel systems. And just through serendipity, um, I ended up focusing on things that happen to be very relevant to the world scaling blockchains today. I also have a, a startup background. So out of MIT, I started a company called Loku back in 2011. Um, okay, that's interesting. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So that was a venture-backed company. It was a machine learning uh, company. Uh, we um, This was at a time when, when there wasn't really that much rich semantic data uh, around small and local businesses online. Uh, and so we, we built a, a crawler and a machine learning system that was able to extract a lot of that information from a lot of the websites that existed out there back then by these small businesses. Oh, wow. So you've, uh, that's, that's quite innovative. So you've always been sort of bright eyed out of university, finished your PhD, and you just want to solve for problems that exist in the world, which help to scale. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I think the, the first company, the experience was really wonderful. I, I built a relationship with my now founders uh, at Cello, Rene, who is the C, is the president of the Cello Foundation. And then Sepp Kumbar was an MIT professor at the time, and he was advising us throughout that first company and then later became a board member. And um, and he's um, also one of the Cello co-founders. Got you. Um, and so it was a really great experience finding people that, that you can you know, trust and, and work together with for, you know, for the whole of your career. Uh, and it was also a great outcome. The company did really well. It got acquired two years later. Uh, it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was a great experience. Amazing. Yeah, no, it sounds like a, a beautiful journey. And so in, in many ways, it sort of set you up for what Cello is today, you and your co-founders. So Marek, for the people listening, could you explain in simple terms what Cello is, as if you were explaining it to someone at the dinner party? Yeah, great, great question. Love the framing. Yeah, Cello is a, a, an EVM compatible platform, you know, a Web3 platform that uh, makes it really easy for developers to build. Uh, I would say really easy to use uh, mobile, you know, Web3 applications. Um, it's, it has a, it's very scalable. It has a really efficient proof of stake protocol behind it. It's EVM compatible. So you can, you can write Solidity code, uh, and, and deploy your smart contracts as if, you know, you were developing on any other Web3 platform. Um, but it also has a few bonus features that, that make it particularly good at delivering these really easy to use experiences. We'll talk about them in, in a bit. They're really around usability and, and also decentralization. So on Cello, you can you can pay for gas with tokens that allows you to send stable coins really easily without having to think about volatile assets. You can send payments to phone numbers in a fully decentralized way, even before the recipient has created a wallet. Uh, that's you know really, really nice from a usability perspective. Uh, and then finally, Stella has a, um, a snark-based like client that allows wallets to end web apps to sync with chain near instantly in a fully trustless manner. And so, yeah, Stella is a, a platform that has all of these, these great features. Perfect. Thank you very much. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the idea of Stella came about and why. Yeah, and so the three of us, uh, Seth, Brenny, and I, we we spent a good amount of time thinking about what we wanted to do next. We we wanted to be very intentional and uh, and we wanted whatever we were doing to be very mission driven. I think that was very important for us for that time in our career. And so so we worked for quite a while in 2017 thinking about what we wanted to, to create. We almost did something in in, in telemedicine, 
uh, which would have been pretty uh, impactful in, in these times. But I, I'm really glad that we we focused on on where we ended up. Um, we at the time we saw we were obviously very very excited about crypto, but we we also just saw it as an amazing opportunity for uh, helping advance financial inclusion. As I'm sure your listeners know, uh, self custody is is just a, a wonderful mechanism for allowing anybody to have access to financial infrastructure that perhaps they uh, might not have had access to before. Yeah. There's 1.7 billion um, people who don't have access to today's financial infrastructure. 1.1 billion who don't have government recognized IDs. And so they're 100% excluded, uh, but with self custody, they're not. You, in most legal jurisdictions, you can self custody crypto assets without any, any ID. Um, and so that got us really, really excited. And that took us down the path of building initially a, a self custodial Venmo like wallet on top of Ethereum. Mm-hmm. And while we were doing that, we learned really quickly that. Uh, Ethereum isn't the right platform to be able to deliver kind of end user product that we wanted to deliver. Mm-hmm. And so that, that ended us taking down the path of, of building Celo, which, you know, really the goal was to be, you know, certainly EVM compatible, but, but also to have all the features that developers need to really build really easy to use mobile applications that, uh, that can rival centralized offerings. Yeah. Okay. So you took that seed of, hundreds and millions, uh, a billion people who want to benefit from self-custody and all of the beautiful uh, DeFi primitives that it enables by by starting with a wallet. And you very quickly realize that the user end product that you want to deliver may not be able to be achieved in Ethereum. And so this idea for Seller was created to produce mobile apps uh, that can enable those billions of people. So your strategy is, is focused more to the unbanked as against, I guess, some of the, the more advanced world. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say entirely uh, focused there. I think from a mission perspective, certainly uh, a lot of the seller ecosystem is focused on, on helping uh, advance financial inclusion and, and just generally uh, around accessibility, universal accessibility, and around helping create the conditions uh, for prosperity for all. But uh, really, if you think about it, making DeFi really easy for people to use, that transcends you know, folks who are unbanked. That, that's useful for everyone. So if, if you're building a DeFi product or you know, a Web3 product that um, you know, is supposed to work in a decentralized way on a mobile phone, and, and just be able to deliver an experience that rivals centralized offerings. We'll talk about what we do differently that enables that. Then, you know, I think Celo is a really, really great platform for, for doing that kind of development. Yeah, for sure. You guys are, are building some very interesting stuff where, with, with that mission statement in mind. Could you tell us a little bit about what you were thinking when you built that wallet extension and you decided that Ethereum needed a slightly different infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. And so we were heavily inspired by Venmo when we were building that wallet early on. That wallet, by the way, um, ended up getting rebranded to Valora and, and exists today on, on Celo, and that's where I spend half of my time. And so if you're if you're curious, definitely feel free to check that out. The, um, but in terms of the features that, that we, we needed in order to deliver this Venmo-like experience, you know, there were a few that, that kind of really immediately popped up. One was just around identifiers, publicly derived addresses. While I think they're pretty simple for you know many crypto savvy folks, for for normies, you know they're pretty intimidating. Obviously, if you get one digit wrong, your your, your funds can be lost forever. That that from a usability perspective is is just too onerous for a lot of users. And so we wanted to do we wanted to have identifiers that were simpler for people. Mm-hmm. And so Sela has this uh, optional phone verification protocol. It's a decentralized phone verification protocol. You get uh, text messages from three randomly uh, sampled participants in the ecosystem. Uh, and you can use that to verify effectively an encrypted version of your phone number that mm-hmm. then people can use to, to uh, send you money. And critically, you can, you can receive funds at the phone number even before you've created your wallet, so even before someone has even told you about you know, this new new wallet that you might want to consider. Uh, and so that was the first kind of hurdle that we needed to, to overcome. Uh, the second one was um, around 
the ergonomics of using stable coins. Mm-hmm. Mind you, this was also 2017. And so back then also stable coins didn't exist the way they do now. But, you know, we saw a lot of development happening in stable coins, but we, we, we still realized that, um, you know, this idea of sending a stable coin and then paying for gas with a volatile asset is just too too complicated uh, for most people. And so we wanted a platform that let you um, actually pay for transaction fees in tokens. So on Celo, you can now uh, have any ERC-20 token that's been allowed listed through on-chain governance, you can use that token to, to pay for gas. Oh, wow. And so there's right now three allowed listed tokens. There's a Celo dollar, the Celo euro, uh, and the Celo Brazilian real, uh, mm-hmm. in addition to the Celo. So you can pay for gas in all four of those uh, currencies. And from an ergonomics perspective, if you are a new user, you're a normie, you just got invited onto uh, a mobile wallet, you received some, say, several euros, you can then send that on to someone else without having to go and try to figure out how you're going to get the currency to pay for gas. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure a lot of our listeners, including probably both of us, have been in a position before where you've got an asset on your wallet and all of a sudden you forgot about gas. So now there's another transaction, more fees, more time, really. So you you guys building for usability, ease of use, it really sticks out in the product. And let's say in 2017, if this was your focus, how has that evolved as we've gone through the journey over these past five years? What is what is the current status of achieving that? What are some of the things that you guys are are building or have been building already to that regard? Yeah, great question. And and I think that brings me actually to the third thing that, that we thought was was um, lacking back in 2017 on Ethereum, um, which took us quite a while to build. And that's, uh, and that's a, a light client that realistically works on, on mobile devices or even inside a web app. Uh, this was the hardest thing for us to deliver and required a lot of really advanced cryptography, but we were able to pull it off. So we have, Celo has a light client that, that uses ZK Snarks to effectively prove that a header is part of the chain. And this, from a decentralization and censorship resistant perspective, is just you know absolutely critical. I think a, a lot of your listeners probably know that a lot of um, Web3 apps today connect to these chains primarily through RPC nodes like Infura. Yeah. And while I think that's uh, a great way to, to kind of accelerate uh, all of this really exciting development that's been happening in our space. It ultimately is antithetical to kind of the, the um, kind of decentralized world we're trying to build. Uh, and so the way to get around that is to have web apps and mobile apps communicate with the chain directly, with the P2P network directly, and do so in a trustless manner without having to trust any third party. And so we, I think we've got a sense of why that's important, but could you tell us a bit at a high level about how that would work? Yeah, so the way it works is, um, so Sela has a proof of stake consensus protocol. You elect a validator set that then performs EFT consensus every, every five seconds. Um, the validator set is fixed for uh, a period of around one day. And so if you're syncing with that chain, a, a naive, I guess, implementation, which is already 17,000 times faster than, than what Ethereum does, uh, would be just to download the last header of each day and use that to, to um, keep track of the validator set. Uh, and verify each validator set change. Uh, and then you'll, you'll quickly get to the last epoch and then have the current validator set. From that point on, you can verify any header and therefore any, any state using market proofs in the chain. And so, so that's kind of a, a relatively simple like client that you can build on Celo. But then to get to you know, something that only requires a few kilobytes of data to download, um, we, we basically implemented the algorithm in, in a snark circuit so that you can simply download, so that a full node can run all of that, uh, construct a, a snark proof that it did it correctly. And then a, a light client can simply download that snark proof and, and verify it. Uh, we also have WASM code for that. So you can do this in the web app as well. And you can actually have fully, you know, capital D, dApps um, that connect with the P2P network directly and can sync with the network directly in the manner of, you know, just seconds by downloading just a, a tiny bit of data. 
yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, that's really compelling. So this developer focus, which you've got, or app focus, usability, really stretches across all the ecosystem actors. Not only is it outward facing, it's inward facing. And could you tell us a little bit about how you're focusing on bringing the larger dApps to coming to Stello, building on top of Stello in the manner which is you know quick, efficient, and creates an extremely good user experience? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think really first and foremost that, um, that starts with being EVM compatible. Um, so Celo is fully EVM compatible down to the last, uh, Ethereum hard fork. A lot of folks in the Celo ecosystem, you know, are also in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, we're, you know, very much, uh, aligned with the, the Ethereum kind of roadmap and, uh, and kind of desires in, in the coming years. And, and so that's, that's meant that, you know, we, we've had a few, uh, or quite a number of, um, kind of EVM or big Ethereum web apps, uh, deploy on Celo. I think most recently Uniswap, uh, just launched, um, just this past week on Celo. Uh, and so oh, wow, we're really, exciting. yeah, really, really stoked about that. And, you know, I think in terms of why, so because we're even compatible, I think it's relatively easy uh, for folks to deploy. If, if they want to leverage some of these bonus features of ours, like the decentralized phone verification, which you can use for, for uh, symbol resistance or the ability to pay for gas, a lot of dApps get that for free because that's basically implemented at the wallet level. You know, they, dApps can choose to, to leverage some of the Celo features, but they don't have to. They can just very easily just, just deploy on Celo and get all of the scalability improvements that come with my Celo's really, uh, fast proof of stake consensus protocol. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that, uh, these, these dApps get is, is access to, to all of the users on Celo. Celo has, I think, last I checked around 6 million kind of unique, uh, wallet addresses. On the platform, um, when we track our users, we, we see that many of them are quite quite global. Um, the wallets on Celo are frequently used in over 150 countries worldwide, and so we have a very very global audience uh, that is using the platform in a way that that is, I think, more relevant to their day to day. A lot of people are getting paid uh, in stable coins on Celo for doing micro work, for example. Uh, there's big, uh, UBI programs on Celo. Uh, there's entire communities where people transact, uh, daily using Celo mobile wallets and use wallets in a way that, um, you and I use, you know, something like Venmo, um, in the US. And so these users need a lot of the exciting DeFi products that exist on, on Ethereum and elsewhere. Um, and if, you're a DAP developer that is interested in, in targeting these users through really easy to use mobile experiences. Celo is a really, really great platform for you to, to access those users. Yeah, definitely. It sounds, it sounds like a really compelling use case for many DAPs. And if they were interested, where, where should they go? What's the, what's the 101? Yeah, I mean, Celo.org is, uh, is the main page run by the Celo Foundation. The, there's also a pretty comprehensive, you know, documentation site at docs.celo.org. Uh, obviously for up-to-date information, the, the Celo Twitter account is a great source of information. Uh, that's uh, at Celo.org. Yeah, I would start at, with these three places. And then finally, you know, the community sits in Discord. So. Uh, chat.celo.org will redirect you to, to the Celo Discord community. Amazing. And so now we have this environment almost where you've started to reach that problem you were, you were solving for in the very beginning, enabling people in a permissionless manner, regardless of you know age, background, income level, to benefit from DeFi. What are some of the challenges you've been experiencing in, in the more recent months? Um, how has that problem changed, if at all, in terms of scaling the access to DeFi? Yeah, it's a really great question. You know, I think on and off ramps are ultimately the the biggest bottleneck right now. Um, I think for for really all of crypto, you know, we already have platforms that are easy to use, where you can you know and pay for gas with tokens, uh, where you can use phone numbers as identifiers. You can literally send money to any phone number. 
uh, in the world now. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, but that's only useful if people can use that money on, on the receiving end. Yeah. Uh, and so that is, that's one focus for us right now, uh, really to, to create on and off ramps in, in every country in the world. And we're doing that with two efforts, I would say. One is, a, is an open standardized API uh, that, that I see can be useful for more than just a cell ecosystem. And I encourage all wallets and on and off ramp companies to, to take a look at it. Um, that's called Fiat Connect. Um, it's available at fiatconnect.org. If you think about the problem that Wallet Connect solved, you know, there's a lot of dApps and there's a lot of wallets that all need to interoperate together. Having a standard so that everyone only implements against one standard simplifies everyone's life immensely. Yeah. Definitely. And so we think that the same is needed in the on and off ramp world. There is now a lot of wallets and there's increasingly a lot of uh, on and off ramp companies. If we're going to cover the whole world, you're probably going to have on and off ramp companies in every country in the world that have licenses in every country in the world, uh, that have the local banking relationships with banks in every country in the world. That's going to create a lot of on and off ramps. Um, and so the only way that we can solve this many-to-many -many integration kind of nightmare that, that is starting to appear is through a standard. And so that's via Connect. And in, and so we just launched that uh, in April. And, and now there's, I think, at least 30 companies that are uh, coalescing around the standard and, and building against it. And, and that number keeps growing every every week. Uh, and then the second uh, thing that we need are you know incentives. Um, incentives are a really great way to accelerate change. And, and so the Stella Foundation has uh, created a $20 million uh, competition. It's called Connect the World, uh, which is effectively rewarding the first on and off from company in, in every country in the world for implementing Fiat Connect uh, and then actually launching and, and serving uh, customers. That's pretty exciting. You know, $20 million is a good sum. And yeah, certainly. Yeah. And, you know, if you're an on and off from company that has a license to operate in, in one country or multiple countries, uh, then, then it's, you know, relatively easy for you to, to adopt the Connect and, and kind of get a, get a piece of that $20 million. And so there's, there's a lot of companies now that are competing. And what's cool is they're competing in, in markets that I think right now aren't uh, well served globally. I think one of the nice things about the competition is the prize is the same regardless of the, of the country that you pick. And so you can go into markets that have less competition and still get the same, same reward. And so that, and that's a really great way for us to incentivize global coverage. Uh, because we know that the, the big markets are going to be well served and they're well served today. You know, there's some really amazing on and off farm companies, you know, ramp, wire, transact, simplex, even pay. Um, they're, they're doing a great job, but to service every country in the world, that is a challenge right now. So that, that's a big focus, uh, just coming back to your original question. The other, the other, I think, interesting thing that's happening in the Celo ecosystem is, is around refi. Celo, from the get-go, chose to be a network that uh, offset all of its carbon. This is two years ago when the network launched. It was a governance proposal. It was the first governance proposal to to have block rewards um, go towards uh, offsetting the carbon that the network was was okay. contributing to. Yeah, and you know because Celo is proof of stake based and has a very compelling uh, consensus protocol, it's not using that much electricity. I think if you do the math, each transaction uses less electricity than a Google search. Uh, but oh, wow. still, I think, you know, crypto has a reputation uh, around being bad for the environment. And so we wanted to, to really over deliver on this front. And so not only is the network offsetting the carbon, it's actually offsetting more than it's contributing to. And so Celo... Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we frequently say that Celo is a, is a carbon negative chain. Yeah. Uh, and it was certainly the first chain of this nature. I think more recently, some other networks started um, adopting this as well. But I think because we were the first and because this is so important to us as an ecosystem and as a, as a community, a, a lot of refi projects have picked Celo as their home. Uh, and as a result, there's now increasingly network effects being created thanks to these protocols already coming to Celo. And so that's attracting even more protocols. And so there's a lot of really, I would say, interesting refi uh, activities happening on Celo. 
And that gets me really excited because one of the amazing things about programmable money is that you can you can innovate, you can do things that are new and interesting. And, and one thing that's always been near and dear to us uh, is this idea of backing money by assets that are um, good at fighting climate change, or that we just want to see more of in the world. Um, one of our advisors and and you know people who who really inspired us early on is Charles Eisenstein. He's a well known author and. Highly recommend anybody on the call to, to check out some of his writings. Sacred Economics is, is particularly uh, amazing. And he, he wrote it before Bitcoin was invented. And he had some you know, really interesting ideas. And one of those ideas was to, to back money by effectively trees and, and other things we wanted to see more of in the world. And, you know, the argument that he made is, you know, whatever backs money, people want to create more of in the world, right? When gold backed money, people would go out and mine gold. Because you could exchange it for money easily yeah. and and use it to to, to, to do whatever you want to do. And so anything that has intrinsic value, you know, you can use to back money. And, and what better thing to use than, than, you know, pristine rainforest, for example. Yeah. But, you know, before programmable money, you know, that would have required central banks to all coordinate with each other, to have treaties with each other. The lift was just insane, and so yeah. it never really took off as an idea. But now, now you can actually do it. Now that there's uh, protocols that are tokenizing carbon uh, offset credits or tokenizing actual trees and bringing them on chain, suddenly we have assets that you can buy programmatically and use to back stable coins, for example. Yeah. And what's great about these assets is that they're intrinsically much more stable than you know, something like, say, Bitcoin. Uh, and so, in a way, they're even better uh, assets for backing stable coins uh, than than what you know some protocols have used to date. And so, yeah, there's a lot of work happening uh, in refi on Celo, and then the the Mentos stable coins that are on Celo are now also increasingly adding these refi assets to the the reserve that backs these stable coins. It's not going to be like one-to-one -one backing anytime soon. Um, I think you need a lot of EV for assets so that the system is sufficiently decentralized. Uh, and these assets have to have a lot of liquidity. And I mean, there needs to just be uh, a, a lot of them. But slowly, uh, the community is, uh, is adding... For example, 0.5% you know, of the reserve is now backed by Moss Carbon Offset Credits. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's um, proposals that are currently being worked on to add other other assets, low so carbon, toucan, and, and other voluntary carbon offset credit protocols. Yeah. Add those tokens into the reserve, and and as well as other really exciting new um, refi assets. And so, you know, it it might not be long before you're you're going to be able to to actually transact daily and and actually pick a stablecoin that. And it matches your core values, your beliefs, which you know I think is going to be a really exciting world to live in. For sure, yeah, it's it's great to see how you guys were solving for problems of today already, and now that you've reached the stage where you are really solving for those problems, you're also continuously looking to solve the problems of tomorrow. You know, climate change, things such as putting your money with products or services that align with your core values is very much a, a broader change we're seeing in the world, and it's great to see people like. Cello are innovating to bring that into the benefits of the decentralized world. I think many of our of our listeners will find that really compelling, and suddenly it's it's very exciting to see where refi goes. If you if you don't mind, I do also want to want to touch in. You guys, you mentioned earlier about the UBI that you have on Cello. For those that don't know, would you be able to explain a bit what UBI is and how it works on Cello? Absolutely. So UBI stands for Universal Basic Income. It's uh, it's a type of humanitarian aid um, that's becoming more popular uh, as of late. And you know the idea is primarily that from a capital efficiency perspective, you know giving giving cash to people who need it uh, is just a really effective way of distributing aid. It used to be that I think there was a belief that you know giving you know for example like food might be a better way. So for example, the World Food Program used to primarily give kind of food but that's that's now changed uh, the world food program actually gives uh, half of their annual budget now out in, in basically cash uh, yeah. and then people use it to to buy food and they can get better um, 
nutritional diversity. They can use it for medicine if, if they need it in a particular kind of week. Uh, it, it just creates uh, a, a lot of benefits. Um, yeah, and so and achieve the end goal of delivering the aid in a, in a better way. With lower overheads. Yeah. And not surprisingly, um, this gets easier and cheaper with better and better technology. And so in the, in the traditional space, GiveDirectly was considered a, a leader uh, in this regard. And, and they were using a lot of mobile money and, and other more recent you know, technological advancements to deliver this kind of aid. And since then, now that we have um, you know, blockchains that can send uh, that work universally the same way in, in every country in the world, increasingly we're seeing uh, folks uh, distribute that kind of aid uh, on, on public blockchains. And so we've done work with you know, folks like Mercy Corps, with the Green Foundation, and, and also we give directly. But I think the thing that is probably uh, the, the most exciting is, is a Web3 native protocol called Impact Market that uh, they're based out of Portugal. They've raised millions of dollars uh, of donations and, and they've uh, distributed it to over 50,000 uh, beneficiaries worldwide, giving out on the order of 50 cents uh, a day. And uh, and then in the, and they operate in, in really adversarial kind of conditions. Um, you know, they're in favela communities in Brazil. They're in they're in Venezuela. They're in Nigeria and Ghana and in a bunch of communities throughout Africa. Yeah, so uh, really at the forefront. Of yeah, making a difference in the world. And more recently in in Afghanistan and even even in Ukraine. Wow. Um, and so and one of the I think really amazing kind of insights into into their deployment and, and operations is that they can do this at overhead costs that are significantly lower they're estimating over an order of magnitude lower than even folks like give directly and yeah. give directly has up until now really been considered the leader in terms of being able to do things like this in a really capital efficient manner mm -hmm. and, and the reason for this you know it just makes sense right like they have this their same exact product that works in every country in the world because it's running on a on a global you know public blockchain, yeah. they don't have to have an engineering team that you know builds something that works you know in this country in that country on mobile money here or maybe you know a bank transfer system here. They can just use the same settlement layer that works everywhere. Yeah, um, and and that's great because better capital efficiency means more aid is just distributed to the people who, who actually need it. Yeah. In a more efficient manner as well. That's um, no, it's a it's a tremendously exciting innovation to see. As we've seen these UBI and aid programs evolve over the years, it's it's incredible to see where they could go tomorrow. Even if there was some connection between refi and this UBI concept, I think I think it makes for some tremendously exciting opportunities which are available at Cello today. And I think we would be really curious as an audience about how you're seeing Cello change in the next two, three, four years, building on some of this incredible work you've done already. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that's ahead of Web3 is really a kind of infrastructure inversion kind of phenomenon that, that hopefully will happen around payments. You know, if you remember Satoshi's white paper, there was a lot of talk about payments in, in that white paper, but you know, to date, it hasn't really taken off yeah, I think in the way that everyone hoped. Yeah, and a part of that is because you know I think we talked about like UX, like you need to be able to pay for gas with stable coins for you to be able to use them mm -hmm. realistically for payments. And then part of it is also just you know we need those on and off ramps in every country in the world, and you know bootstrapping those kinds of uh, network effects just takes time. It's easier to build a product that doesn't need a counterparty, you know, by putting value into smart contracts and then creating DEXs or lending protocols that effectively, you know, you never have to pair two people together. Yeah. It's a lot easier to, to bootstrap with products like that than to bootstrap with products that always require two people to have access to liquidity on both sides. But we're getting to the point now where, where an increasing amount of people have wallets, have liquidity, have the ability to on and off ramp. And what that means is that, you know, payments are going to just overnight explode. And, you know, I think because Celo is, is very scalable, uh, because you can, you can pay for transaction fees with 
uh, stable coins, um, you know, it's just really well positioned as a platform to uh, really deliver on that future. I mean, so a lot of what we're working on now it includes thinking about that. Um, and, you know, I think obviously mobile payments is, is one piece of this, uh, remittances, you know, for big companies uh, or telcos is another big piece of it. But the other thing that, that's happening that's really exciting, there's a company uh, called Amer Group that, that is building self-custodial smart cards that have private keys embedded in the smart chip on a, you know, credit card looking uh, card. I have one here I can show. Okay. Uh, show you, uh, and then maybe you can describe it to the audience. But what's really exciting about about this is, you know, we can we can offer self custodial wallets that you know people can just keep in their in their wallet with a with a UX that people are used to today. Uh, and so these these cards support NFC, and you can just simply tap to pay on a special POS device. That, that supports this and then have the POS device send the transaction through NFC up to the chip. Okay. The chip then signs it and then sends it back through NFC back to the Amazing. device. And you can literally tap to pay and have the transaction settled on a blockchain. Yeah, I can I can really see the focus on UI UX though. That looks exactly like my, my debit card that I have in my wallet today. And from what you're saying, functions in exactly the same way as you. Exactly. Only uh, it's settled on a carbon negative chain. Yeah. And you can use stable coins that are backed now increasingly by refi assets. That's so incredible. that's that's a really cool feature. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like science fiction. Yeah. Uh, which is <laughs> what makes it, I think, even more exciting. But you know, unlike science fiction, you know, this is a world that that is very, very, very possible, and you know, is coming your way really soon. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's 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 really really exciting to hear about all of these compelling use cases that exist on Cello today, solving impro- important problems around the world. Um, you know, we've been honoured to have you here. I think just before we close off, I want to say if there's anything that the Cello community or our community who are interested to find out a bit more should be watching out for, maybe some events or a new feature release. Yeah, great, great question. So I don't know when this is going to be released, but come. You know, we have a monthly all hands called Koneko. It's a community call. Definitely, you know, follow us on Twitter and, and come join those calls. And uh, yeah, and, and don't be shy. Come come join our Discord and say hello. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Marek, for your time. It was a pleasure to have you here. And hopefully we'll have you back soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.